had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. And that's part of, again, this very specific uh, retelling by John because he's an eyewitness. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put a purple robe on him. Hail, king of the Jews. They mocked as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I am going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said, Look, here's a man. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him yourselves and crucify him. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Are you a daring person? Are you a courageous person? Someone who could stand up against all social and peer pressure when everybody says, do this, go right. You are willing and courageously willing to go left. You can stand up for truth and for God and for a friend when everybody else rejects all three. Are you a daring and courageous person? Uh, we, we survived high school, so I guess we are, right? <laughs> high school, man. Well, that's like peer pressure maximum or security. We all, some of you guys are still in high school. I feel for you guys. Yeah. Surely now that we're beyond teenager, right? Uh, we, we are beyond social pressure, right? We, we could stand up against it, right? We are courageous and bold. Davy and John Kim, uh, they were eighth grade friends. They were the best of friends, and they wanted to be cool. So they started the skinny jean club, and they started a skitter band. But the thing is, there were two strikes against them. One is this. Um, they loved spelling, and they were good. And they entered spelling bee contests. You cannot be good in middle school, cool in middle school, while being good in spelling bee. And another thing was this. They were Asians. They were the only Asians in that school. With the Asian thing, they could not do anything about it. Spelling bee, they could not do anything about it either, because they loved good competition. So they competed. They won in their school. And they went to the regionals. And they carpooled there. And they were like, we're going to win this all. And when they went there, they checked out the competition. And the four older judges and everyone else was there. No one were Asian except them two. They were committed. They were going to win this. And so John went out first. And then David. And the competition was fierce. And people got, kids got cut left and right. And all the kids who got cut would go to the back and cry. It was John's turn. And then the judge, the older one, probably the main judge, snickered and laughed and said, Okay, son, you're going to get this word. The word for you is oriental. The word for you is oriental. <laughs> what are the chances? And all the judges are snickering and they're laughing. Now the whole crowd is laughing. And there is John. He's nervous. He's already nervous, but now with all this awkward situation, he's nervous, more nervous. And starts, O R. E, and he knows he messed it up. He messed up and he starts walking. Now Davy, his friend, he's furious. He wants to get back. And he knows the only way to get back is to win it all. So now his mind is running around. What is he going to get? Asiatic, Confucius, he sends up. The word for you is raconteur. Raconteur. He's never heard this word. I mean, not the meaning of it. He's heard it, but not, he doesn't know the meaning of it. But he's pretty confident he can spell it out. So he asks, you know, the root of it, the sentences, of it, and all of it. And he's ready to spell it out. But in the corner of his eyes, he sees his friend, John. He's not crying, but he's deeply sad. Raconteur. R. A. C. I. S. T. Raconteur. And he goes back, hugs his friend, and walks out, medalist but victorious. Wow, what kind of courage, right? Like, man, I wish I was smart as that. I wish I had the courage to do that. But most of us, most of us lack that courage. Most of us cave in on the social pressure. Most of us confirm. Remember that famous study that was done in the 50s? Uh, it was Ash um, test. What it was is he brought a group in, and actually all everyone in the group were Confederates actors. Only one was a real volunteer, a participant, and they would show these lines, right, in A, B, C, and they would say which one is the longest line, and one is the longest line for sure. But all the actors and Confederates were told to say the shorter one is the longest one, and so. 
verse through nine, they will all say the short one is the longest one. And the real participant, the only volunteer who in his eyes knows clearly what is the longest, would all agree, 75% of them would agree with the rest of the Confederates, that indeed the short one is the longest one. And actually this surprised the sociologist because he thought, surely when it's so uh, in your face, when it's so obvious, they will not follow the social norm. But it turns out 75% confirm. And that's what we see here today, don't we? We see people here, not courageous, but confirming, just going with the crowd. And so we see actually the crowd. The crowd gathers and they say, crucify him and crucify him. And I wonder how many of them really believe that. I am confident that some of those people individually in their heart, they said, this is not right. This is not right because, remember a week ago in the narrative, Jesus coming in and people come out with palms and they say, Hail, you know, you come, Hosanna, King of the Jews. And they're excited and they're excited, save us. But now they're here, some of the same people, and they can't say what's in their heart because they feel if they say it, then people will look at them and judge them. And I wonder if maybe even 50% of them individually thought Jesus was not worth it being crucified. He, he was innocent, but they all went with the crowd. They were all afraid of what the other person will say. So they all joined in. But when you look at the details of it, we see that it was the, the priest and the temple guards. So we say, you know what? It's not really fair to judge them because they really didn't have the power. They were temple guards, which meant they were slaves of the priest. Basically, the priest kind of filled the table with food. How can they go against that? They were the bosses. So they must go with the boss. So the boss says, crucify him. They will say, crucify him. Because, hey, they feed them, so they need to do this. And so maybe, you know, with them, it's like they didn't have power. They really don't have any place for courage. So then the question is then, what about, what if you do have power? What if people who do have power, can they also be courageous or do they confirm? Do they do what it, they know to be sure is not right? And in today's story, actually, we see three people. Three people who are powerful in their own ways. Politically powerful, economically powerful, and even told them religiously and morally powerful, and they confirm. They lack courage. They do what they know is wrong. First is Pilate, isn't he? Pilate is a powerful person. He is the most powerful person in Judea. He is the fifth prefect. And we know that he knows he has power. And we know that he sometimes even abuses power because a few years after this event, he crushes the Samaritan rev- uh, re- rebellion so severely that even the Roman emperor eventually pulls him back. So he knows he has power. Yet in this place, he just crumbles. He doesn't use his power. He's powerful, and yet he's made powerless. John chapter 19 Verse 10. The Jewish leaders replied, By law he ought to die because he called himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back into the headquarters again and asked him, Who are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me? Pilate demanded. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or crucify you? <laughs> he knows it. He has the power to release him or crucify him. But he doesn't. He he knows he has a power. Whatever he says will be done. He has interrogated Jesus constantly. And throughout this whole narrative, he always concludes, Oh, Jesus is innocent. Oh, Jesus is innocent. So put that two, two, the two together. Jesus is innocent. You have the power to release him. Why doesn't he? He plays a game, doesn't he? And if you're familiar with the chapter, he plays a game. He plays drama. He tries to bring in the thing. And so eventually he wants to wash his hand of the responsibility. But ultimately, it was his hand that signed off on the execution. It was him. It was him. He had the power to release an innocent man. He knew he was innocent, and he did not do it. This powerful man becomes powerless because of social pressure. What is it given? Because people are saying, crucify him, crucify him. And then do you remember the one part? John chapter 19, verse 12 through 16. Then Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish leader shouted, If you release this man, you are no friends of Caesar. 
anyone to claim himself as a king is a rebel against Caesar. When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. And Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called the stone pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was now about noon, the day of the preparation for the Passover. And Pilate said to the people, look, here's a king. Away with him, they yell. Social pressure, look, you're going to do this. We're going to tell Caesar, you're not a friend of Caesar. You're not going to be hanging out with us anymore. Peer pressure. Away with him, crucify him. What? Crucify your king, Pilate? We have no king but Caesar. The leading priest shouted back. Then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. It's Pilate's final decision. It is his decision. And he caves in to the peer pressure, to the social pressure. Strange thing, the social pressure. It's so powerful. It's so powerful. It, it robs us of any courage. It forces us to confirm. And even a strong man like Pilate has to give in. And then there's also other people here. Again, powerful people. People who have their own resources. Like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. That John chapter 19, verse 38 and 42. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus, because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple. Is there such a thing as a secret disciple? Someone who's quiet about following Christ? Someone who doesn't want other people to know that he is following? Can you follow Christ without making it public, keeping it private? Now John, you know, you know John, right? Narrator, he doesn't uh, cover up. He just tells things as it is. And here it is, very clearly. Joseph who knew that Jesus was a holy man. To be a disciple man, at least he recognized that this was a truth teller, a rabbi. Maybe he even believed in the Messiah. In other gospel writers, he talks about he's waiting for the kingdom. So maybe he really believed that he's the Messiah. But he kept it secret. Now Joseph was a powerful man. He was part of the council, the Sanhedrin, the high council. He was the elite. He was in that Sanhedrin, the high council, when they decided to say to commit to murdering Jesus. He was there. He, all he had to say was no. He had power. He had money too. Eventually later, he does give the tomb. We'll look at that a little bit later. That means the stone tomb to Jesus. That means he had money. He had money. And maybe it was the money that gave him the power, the seat in the elite high council. And he knew that Jesus was a truth teller. And he kept it secret. This guy who had slaves was a slave to his own fear because of peer pressure. Because everybody said Jesus was wrong. And he just couldn't get himself to say, no, I disagree. He couldn't say that. Strange thing. Powerful thing. Too powerful. This social pressure. This peer pressure. To confirm. Friends, are you a courageous person? Or are you a confirming person? Do your workers know that you are a Christ follower? Or do you keep it quiet? Do they know that you spend a beautiful Sunday morning here in the church? Do they know that you read the Bible? Do they know that you believe that Jesus is resurrected? Or is it something that you keep quiet? Are you a courageous person? Or am I a confirming person? Nicodemus too, right? He talks about Nicodemus, and notice the narrative, right? Very detailed. So, Nicodemus who came to Jesus in the night. John chapter 3, right? Why does he come to the night? Because he's afraid. <laughs> Nicodemus, and here, what Nicodemus does, is he gives 75 pounds of myrrh to embalm and to perfume Jesus' body. 75 pounds, that's heavy. That's like a fourth grader or a fifth grader. And myrrh sometimes costs as much as gold. Can you imagine 75 pounds of gold? That's a lot of money, which meant this guy was wealthy. He was like Joseph. He had lots of money. He had a lot of connections. And he, on top of all that, he was a Pharisee, meaning he had the respect, respect of the people. Pharisee was seen like as, a, as a, the religious leaders of the people, right? The Sadducees were seen as elites. Pharisees were was seen as one of the people. Yet him, even this guy who had the popularity and the fame and, 
the recognition, he caves in. And he had even a more personal connection to Jesus, didn't he? Because he met Jesus. He met Jesus eye to eye. Jesus described the kingdom of God to him. A personal friend connection. And yet through all that trial, all that trial, Nicodemus remains silent. Doesn't say a word. I think he probably even avoided Jesus' eyes. Because what would happen if he made that eye contact? So even people who are powerful become powerless before social pressure, peer pressure. They look all they lose all courage. Friends, are you courageous? Or are you confirming? Ravi Zacharias tells us about um, the pressure that he grew up as a young adult. It just, you know, it's a powerful, ironic thing, this desire to confirm. We, we're so set on confirming and meeting other people's standards because we want to be accepted. We want them to give us approval and value. We think our value and our worth is dependent upon the acceptance. And so we seek it. I, I need my father's yes. I need my boss's yes. I need my friends and roommates yes. I need my religious, I need my peers yes. That's what gives me value and worth. We think our worth is connected to the acceptance. And so we will do whatever we need to do to get their acceptance. But here's the ironic thing. As we do that, we die to ourselves. And as we do that, eventually, we even come to a point where it kills us. We're so hungry for affirmation and acceptance by the society, if we don't get it, we'll even come to a point of suicide. And that's where you really see the, the dark heart of social acceptance. It destroys you. Rabbi Zacharias talks about, again, the stress that he went through when he was a young man. And one of his friends uh, almost committed suicide because he didn't come out as number one in the whole New Delhi. One of his college friends burned himself because he didn't make the grade. Rabbi Zacharias himself, who is a brilliant apologist, uh, a philosopher, he himself tried to commit suicide because he felt his father was ashamed of him. There you see the dark heart of social conformity. We need worth. We think it comes from acceptance by others. So we try to seek it and we try to confirm. And when we don't get it, we think we're worthless and then we destroy ourselves. But even if we don't get to the point of suicide, every time we confirm, every time we do what we know is wrong, every time we don't do what we know is right, we kill ourselves little by little, don't we? Destroy ourselves slowly, one compromise at a time. Now, in the midst of this story, Jesus stands differently, doesn't he? So you have Pilate who seems to be powerful and he caves in. We have Joseph who's the high counsel and he caves in. We have Nicodemus who has lots of money and he caves in. None of them has a, has a heart. <laughs> but there is Jesus. Jesus Again, when you read through this, he's the one who speaks most clearly, doesn't he? He doesn't change from left and right. He doesn't flip-flop. He's very clear about truth. And he's very courageous. And he's the one who gets rejected by everybody. Jesus, where do you have the courage? The crucifixion was a painful, painful physical suffering. But that wasn't the worst of it. You know what the worst of it was? The social rejection that it was publicly expressing. That was the main point of the cross. This wasn't uh, just a quick cut of the throat. That's grace in one sense. <laughs> quick death. But this was, you hang on the cross for days for everyone to see, everyone to point to you and ridicule you, to see your nakedness. The main point of the crucifixion was to say, this is not a human being. He is rejected by every sphere, every community. And this is what the Jews wanted Jesus to be crucified. He didn't, they didn't want any other death. They wanted the worst form. This was a perfect death for Jesus. In the Roman Empire, it was a way to say, this guy has no social value. And in the religious term, Deuteronomy, it says anyone who's tied to the wood is cursed by God. 
And they were like, this is perfect. Rejected by men. Rejected by God. Crucified Jesus. And there he is, Jesus. Literally hanging all alone. And everybody ridiculing him. And all his friends departing. And even God remaining silent. Yet, he says, it is finished. What courage. Where do you get that courage, Jesus? Teach us how to be that courageous. Where do you get the courage to say no to all peer and social pressure and be faithful to your mission? John chapter 19, verse 11. Then Jesus said, you would have, talking with um, Pilate, you would have no power over me at all unless it were given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greatest sin. Jesus answered, My kingdom, verse 36, My kingdom is not another part of 19, verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my father would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, So you are a king. Jesus responded, You say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. In two parts of this conversation with Pilate, we see where the source of Jesus' courage is. He knows that the power is not in Pilate or any other people. The power is not in people's words of approval. The only source of power is God. Because the only thing that matters is God's approval and acceptance. See, Jesus knows himself. And that's where his courage comes from. See, if we think our worth is dependent upon other people's acceptance, we will never have a place to be bold and courageous. Because we will need that acceptance, and we will confirm. But Jesus is independent in a sense. He knows that the only person's acceptance that matters is God. If God says yes, everyone's no's are negated. All I need is God's acceptance. And that's why Jesus once teaches, right? He says, don't be afraid of men who can destroy your body. Be afraid of God who can destroy both body and soul. It's the God's acceptance and rejection that matters most. That's what gives us worth. And Jesus totally set his worth upon God's acceptance, and he knew that he was accepted by God. Friends, do you want to be bold and courageous in this world where everything pressures us to compromise and, and to give up and to betray. Know that you are accepted. In Christ, you are accepted by God. That, that's the only thing that matters. That's the only place of value. And if we could just hold on to that truth, then we can walk and be more like Jesus day by day, more courageous. I have here a $20 bill. How many of you guys would like a $20? Okay. So none of you are going to get it. <laughs> okay. $20. Usually most people raise their hands. Okay. This is real $20, by the way. Okay, it's not fake. Okay. Does this $20 bill uh, value change if I crumble it up? If I crumble it up, does it become less, like 19, 18 now? No? What if I step on it? Does it become less? <laughs> it's still $20? No matter what I do with it, the worth still remains the same, doesn't it? Because the worth is not in what other people do to it. See, Jesus knows. Right, no one said yes, so I'm putting it back in here. If our worth is upon God and God gives us the interesting value, you are my son and you are my daughter. And for you, I gave my son. And no matter what other people do, they could crumble you up, they could put you down, they could kick you, they could beat you, they could curse you, they could judge you, they could cut you, they could fire you, they could ridicule you, they could make fun of you. No matter what they do, your worth is not affected. Your value still remains a glorious son and daughter of God. 
This is what Jesus knew. In fact, when you look at it again, the whole book of John, that's what it's about, right? In the beginning, the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. He just knew where he came from, where his value. John chapter 13, before he goes and watches the feast of disciples, he says very clearly over there that he knew where he came from, where he was going. He knows that he is accepted by God, and so this gives him freedom to serve, freedom to be courageous, freedom to be courageous. But how do we get there? Right? I mean, Jesus being crucified, courageous no matter what people say, that's a high idea. How do we get there? Maya Angelou, a brilliant poet, she says this, courage is like a muscle. You got to exercise it. That's all it is. To get to where Christ is, where you can stand for God and truth, no matter what people say, it starts with little, small acts of courage. And that's what you see, too, in today's story about Joseph. Let's just focus on Joseph today. He, he was in the high council. He didn't say a word. He was quiet. He caved in. Shameful. But then after the death, he goes to Pilate and says, give me the body. That's brave. It is daring. It is a courageous act. Because it was a way for him to say that, hey, I do not agree with the Sanhedrin's decision. Jesus is not a man to be thrown into a criminal mass graveyard. I will take his body, and I will give him my tomb. At that point, he definitely got rejected by the high council. Now, but when you think about it, there's so many ways to spin, right? I mean, how risky was it, though, at that point, really? How risky was it? And did it do anything? Jesus had died already. I mean, it would have been so much better if he stood up at the moment of decision. But the decision has been made, it has been followed through, and after the action, he goes, oh, I disagree. It's kind of like being in a board decision, and they make the wrong decision, and then you just raise your hand and say, oh, but I disagreed. It doesn't matter now. It's already been done. It almost feels like as if he's kind of making up for his remorse and guilt. I couldn't do it then, but this is at least something that I could do. You're right, it is, it is something. But as far as Jesus' life, it's too late. He's dead. It's a how far the courage, to be honest. Right? It's a compromising courage, to be honest. Even selfish. To make up for his guilt. And Nicodemus too. Same thing, right? He could have said something, but only after that 75 pounds. Who cares about the 75 pounds? You're perfuming a dead body. Yet they take this small, courageous step. Small, very small, compromised, selfish. But yet, this small act of courage doesn't accomplish something big. Because you can see what could have happened was this. What happens, what would have happened if, if Jesus went to the mass grave? What would happen to the story of resurrection? Jesus resurrected. Okay, so where? They could have gone to the mass grave, but there's so many missing bodies. Which body is Jesus? Is this body Jesus? That body Jesus? Sometimes they left the person on the cross to be eaten by animals and birds. What if that was ha- ha- happened? Then can we talk about the resurrection? No. See, Joseph's act small courage, compromising courage, selfish courage, yet it accomplished something. It became a very important aspect to witness to the resurrection. Now we can say, Jesus rose from the dead. Where's the evidence? Look at the tomb. Everybody knows that there was a tomb, that Jesus was buried in that tomb, but it's empty. Now you've got to explain it. You have to explain it. And also another thing, but this too, it, that the Joseph of Arimathea, someone in the Sanhedrin will give the tomb. See, a lot, lot of liberal scholars who look at the Bible and they say, this part is made up and that part is made up. They look at this part and say, this could not have been made up. Why? Because the Christians hated the Sanhedrins because they're the ones who crucified the Lord. Why would they put in their story, if it's made up, that one of them provided the tomb from which Jesus was resurrected? That, 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 that just defeats their purpose. Unless it happened. And think about this too. But all the gospel stories, they were written within 20, 30 years of the story. And here is all the gospels being very specific. Joseph of Arimathea, 
who was part of the high council, every gospel writer tells us, get to the tomb. Now, if that was fabricated, if that was made up, they could just go and say, hey, look at the record. Joseph and Arimathea, find them. Find them maybe. If Paraguay was still alive then. Did it happen? Yes or no? Yes, it did. Part of the council. I did it. Yes, Joseph, I know him. He did it. Because of his action, okay, it's a small act of comp- act courage, compromise, selfish, but because of that, there's more clear evidence of Christ being resurrected. And the last thing is this, and, th- and this, is, this is beautiful. By doing this, without him even knowing it, he accomplishes a prophecy. Isaiah 53 Verse 9. Part of the prophecy that actually Pastor Chad read in the beginning. Verse 9. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. I don't think Joseph knew this at all. But because he was, like I messed up. And this courage thing, I know it doesn't do anything. It doesn't change Jesus' death. But right now, at least this is what I can do. And he does it, and it fulfills a prophecy. How beautiful is that? And that's the Christ that we serve. Christ, the courageous one, calls us to a life of courage. But Christ also knows that we are broken, and we constantly seek acceptance from other people. And so he pulls us step by step. And so every little act of courage, every little act of courage, he will take it and he will use it for his kingdom. And he'll pull you towards him until you and I become more like Christ, courageous with God and truth. Every little act of courage. So even today, even this week, do small acts of courage. Okay, Whatever compromise that you made, small acts of courage. Maybe it's a calling and say, I'm sorry. Maybe it's an act of saying, I forgive you. Maybe it's buying a flower. Small acts of courage. Maybe it's saying to your neighbor, I will pray for you. Maybe it's telling somebody that I believe in the resurrection. Small acts of courage. Maybe it's in your business and when you meet a Christian, you say, let's start a prayer meeting. Maybe it's an act of courage. You go to the manager, I want to start a prayer meeting here. Small acts of courage that build and build and is used greatly by God. Small acts of courage. New life. As new life is more clear now, uh, as the new senior pastors come in, he said that he wants to support us freely. Uh, so now we're going to consider about new times and new place of worship. Yes, we've gone through a lot of difficulties, but now it's time to follow my core and to go out and risk acts of courage. Every one of us here, individually small acts of courage, together we can do big things. Small acts of courage. Art of marriage is another thing. Right? Especially maybe with us Asians, we're a shame-based culture. We feel like if we join this, that means that our marriage means it's not good or that we might get exposed. Let it get exposed. Small acts of courage. Be honest. Be honest with your relationship. Be honest with other people so that they can be healing. Small acts of courage, which God will use to build His kingdom through which we can finally understand that our value that our worth is not about other people's words or approval, but it's God. Let's pray.